wait a little while or do we want to get started? I think we dive in. Yeah, if we're live. We're, dive in. We're live, yeah. Okay, we are live and in color. Amazing. Can't tell how many people uh, are watching, but. That's okay. Yeah. It's okay. We know we can we're, see each other, so that's something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we're, we're, there's at least four, four people in this room. That's right, four. And your dogs. And your so, dogs. So there we yeah. go. Three dogs, yeah. So there's at least seven here. Okay. There you okay. Go. Um, this is a panel on science fic how to write science fiction and fantasy humor. Um, I am M.H. Bonham, also called Maggie. Uh, Connie Willis is with me, uh, Richard Friesen, and Aaron, and uh, Van Aaron Hughes, or Aaron Hughes. And welcome aboard. And would you please introduce yourselves, uh, starting with Connie? Okay. Hi, I'm Connie Willis. I've been writing science fiction for a very long time. Uh, I write uh, a lot of serious stuff, but a lot of a lot of comedy also. I just finished a comedy novel called The Road to Roswell about alien abduction, which we all know is really funny. And uh, I mean, alien abduction, not my book, but um, and uh, and uh, I just also finished writing a and having out there a, a short story about a Christmas short story called Take a Look at the Top Five and Ten, which is a romantic comedy. And it's uh, coming out from Asimov's in the November, December issue. So it should be out any second now, so. Awesome. Uh, Richard, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Richard Friesen. I write science fiction and fantasy and I have um, two novellas. Eventually there'll be more in a uh, humorous superhero story about narcolepsy whose power is falling asleep. <laughs> and since it's funny we can show it backwards oh, like right? so there narcolepsy is backwards yeah. anyway um yeah. so yeah as far as falling asleep and he takes you into his dreams with him ah. so then lots ah. of fun happens after that yeah. Yeah. so Sounds aaron? good good aaron i am van aaron hughes i am a denver author of science fiction and fantasy short stories um which have appeared in a bunch of different magazines and uh, anthologies. One of them was a winner in the Writers of the Future con contest. Uh, my latest was an online magazine called New Myths, and I have one forthcoming. My next story will be in FNSF, Fantasy and Science Fiction. Um, that's my third story in FNSF, but the first one that's actually humorous. So probably less than half, but a number of my stories are designed to be humorous, and whether, whether they are humorous, you'd have, you'd have to read and decide for yourself. <laughs> Uh, I'm M.H. Bonham, also Maggie Bonham. Oh, there's a cat. Who has to go with the dog. All right. <laughs> we have eight now. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I am a author of some 50 or so novel, uh, well, books, I should say. And um, I am here up in Montana, um, although I originally was in Colorado for, oh, 20 some odd years. Um, anyway, so uh, I write uh, fantasy, science fiction, um, and urban fantasy. My latest uh, is a, uh, my latest series is a humor, snarky kind of fantasy, urban fantasy, uh, which starts with book that dragon was is was in no way my fault and um it uh this series this is free on amazon by the way so go pick one up anyway so now that we've introduced ourselves um what what do you uh, we'll start with connie first what do you see is important are important elements when it comes to uh, humor in uh, in science fiction and fantasy. Okay, I'll start with one because I think it'll take us the hour plus <laughs> to to get to all the elements. But um, one of them I think is uh, uh, that uh, you shouldn't rely on jokes. I'm not saying that jokes can't be part right. of and funny lines can't be part of of comedy, but too often people just think 
writing comedy, when you say it, they immediately think jokes. And most of the really funny people I know in life do not ever tell jokes. You know, they never do the, you know, three people walk into a bar kind of story. Uh, uh -huh. Jokes depend totally on punchline and they're, they're iffy in lots of ways. And uh, although Terry Pratchett somehow uh, managed to work in a number of, of jokes and puns into his work, he still didn't, he's, that still did not form the basis of his humor. And I think it's possible to write comedy um, that is does not have any jokes in it whatsoever. And um, the the humor comes from the from the lines, the the conversation and the banter comes from the overall attitude toward life. Comes from uh, what I would call slapstick, although I don't really mean that. But but situational humor, where you you know uh, what's happening physically to the characters. Um, and just, just all kinds of different elements. And most writers use a combination of them. I think the other thing is no, don't, don't rely totally on jokes. Bad idea to rely totally on jokes. And secondly, don't rely totally on one kind of humor. Uh, there should be a combination of it. And I think Terry Pratchett is an excellent example of that. He will have, he will have situational humor. He will have um, slapstick, he will have banter and, and character interactions that are funny, and he will have jokes also. Uh, and then a whole variety of strange linguistic humor and, and uh, all kinds of things. And he never, he, he's got this whole bag of tricks. And I think that's what a comedy writer should hope to have is a whole bag of tricks because any one kind gets to be predictable and to be problematic for the writer. That Anyway, that's my feeling. I don't know. Maybe people disagree with me on that. Well, I certainly agree with that. Even stand-up comedians these days don't tell jokes. I mean, back right. in vaudeville days, they'd tell one joke after another. Now they tell right. stories. Right. And there are humorous bits to it, but it's not, there's not, there may not be a punchline at all. They're just funny people. Right. 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 You know, one of the things I think the worst thing you could do is listen, is listen to TV sitcoms and trying to figure out how to write comedy because. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's like 90% of it is the comedy of embarrassment and I hate the comedy of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. um, so I would you know, avoid that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, different, not telling jokes and setting up the humor, all of that, yeah. It's, it's a little like, you know, in a lot of storytelling you're saying, what's the worst thing I could have happen to my character? In humor, you can say, what's the funniest thing I can have happen to my character? Right. And often that's the worst thing anyway. Right. But, right. but yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, my question is then, um, you know, to a large degree, I felt that um, humor often comes from the unexpected. Uh, something that's surprising that you didn't expect in a uh, amusing way. Uh, go ahead and I see you nodding, Connie. Why don't you uh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, Mark Twain, uses, Mark Twain uses this all the time. <laughs> the comedy of the unexpected where, where the sentence starts in one place and then ends up in a totally different place from where you thought it was gonna go. His comment about he had the warm beatific smile of a Christian holding four aces. And that the end of that sentence is not where you thought the first part was going to go. And he did he did that all the time. He talks about a ho horrible flood and all the, all through the United States, a terrible terrible flood, uh, historic Noah type pr uh, proportional flood, which uh, meant that East Texas got a quarter of an inch. Yeah. You know, it's not you know it's not where you think it's going to go. And he, the surprise is why why you laugh. The other person who did that was uh, Gracie Allen of Burns and Allen. And she was, she did what's called tangential humor, which is um, she's looking at the world from a completely different angle from you. Um, and my favorite Gracie Allen bit, uh, although there are like thousands of them, was one where, um, so, so George Burns gives her a, a beautiful fur coat and, and, uh, she's just she loves it and he says yeah it's you know it's hard it's a mink coat and she says oh it's it's hard to imagine he says um that such a beautiful coat 
could, could come from such a weasley looking little animal. And she says, oh, George, you know, I think you're cute. And so <laughs> not, not where they thought that was going. And, and she's viewing it uh, just from a different angle. It's, it's really hard. I do not recommend actually trying to do Gracie Allen humor because it's really hard. You have to have this off the wall view of the world that's different from anybody else. You know, um, when, when they used to have Carnation Milk as their sponsor and, um, and somebody in the course of one of their shows brings her a bouquet of carnations and she says, oh, these are just gorgeous. I'll take them right out to the kitchen and milk them. And, <laughs> you know, and you're like, I could not have thought of that in a million years, you know, and I don't think a room full of script writers could sit around and think of it in a million years. Apparently Gracie did all her own tangential jokes. So I, I, I say I don't recommend, I mean, I think it makes for really effective humor, but it's, it takes a certain sort of quirky mind that looks at things from a really left-handed view and, uh, and is hard to do, so. What was the question again? Uh, the question was, uh, well, basically, I mentioned that um, I've noticed that humor <clears throat> often has to do with the unexpected, oh, something, right. something unexpected. coming at you in an opposite direction that you expect. Um, would you like to elaborate on that a bit more, Richard? Sure. Um... I mean, it, even just with narcolepsy, the the whole premise is that. I mean, the superheroes are supposed to be strong or fast or, you know, shoot lightning bolts or something, and he falls asleep. <laughs> and um, even to the villains, you know, he grabs them and falls asleep. Um, you know, so just that can create funny situations because no one's expecting it. Um, but that is nowhere near all of it. I'm, I'm going to make a confession here. I learned a great deal of what I do and what I did in narcolepsy from Connie. Um, there's a, there's a article he wrote. It's actually out there on Scrib D. I'm going to put it in the chat so everybody can have a link to it. Um, all panelists. That's not what I want. Um, but um, there's a very good, uh, article on comedy and the different kinds of comedy and and yeah just and one of the things i do with with narcolepsy is come up with the ab absurdist comedy because they're in actual dreams so like anything can happen and i had uh um so yeah that you're going along and talk about unexpected you know you're you're going along and oh i don't know um right. You're in the Wizard of Oz haunted forest, and suddenly you're playing Munchkin football. <laughs> yeah, um, you know. So, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, Aaron. Fo yeah. Following up on what you just said, I I love absurdist humor, but often that's the key to it. It has to be something absurd that you didn't see coming. If it's something absurd right. that you anticipated, <laughs> it's just a whole lot less funny. Um, True. And my, my story that's coming out in FNSF involves playing the sport of curling with aliens. And what I, what I hope makes it fun is the main character is this middle-aged guy living in Denver who it's just coincidence and I'm a middle-aged guy living in Denver and he <laughs> has a teenage son who's really cool. And it's a coincidence that I have a teenage son who's really cool. <laughs> and you realize over the course of the story that when they meet these aliens and all this crazy stuff is happening, the son knew every aspect of what was going to happen before it did. And it's just the father who's clueless. And I hope some a lot of readers don't see that coming, although most parents who are reading it know that their <laughs> kids always know more than they do about right. what's going to happen next. Right. I think that uh, that brings us to, to the comedy of anticipation, which is the opposite of the unexpected, where in, in certain comic works, you know exactly what's going to happen. You know, um, in every P.G. Woodhouse, Jeeves, and Wooster story, mm -hmm. Birdie is going to want to buy a, oh, a, a yellow dinner jacket or a pair of purple pajamas or something completely, a straw hat that's completely unacceptable to Jeeves, who is the perfect gentleman. And uh, over the course of the story, uh, Birdie will insist on wearing this. Um, Jeeves will grudgingly go along. 
they will then find themselves in a situation where Bertie is in so much trouble that the only way out is to appeal to Jeeves and Jeeves will promise to help him on the grounds that he gives up the yellow dinner jacket or the purple pajamas or whatever. And um, this is, it's part of the fun. You know, it's not the unexpected. It's like you settle down with the Jeeves and Wooster, Jeeves and Bertie story and you think, oh, <laughs> I see what's, where this is going. I wonder what kind of trouble Bertie will get into. I wonder what will happen here that will end up making him give this up. And you just want to say to poor Bertie, just give up the pajamas. Give them up right now. It will save you so much trouble in the long run. But it, it is a, you, you can't do it with all kinds of comedy and you can't do it with like, you can do it over the course of a novel. I wouldn't recommend it like for a short story because it, you've got to, it's got to have a long setup and you've got to become familiar. But you're basically, the humor comes from the fact that you're inviting the reader in. The reader becomes a part of the story because he's like, I know what's going to happen here. This is great. And, uh, and then is right with you every step of the way rather than being surprised at the end. But, um, but uh, the, uh, another person who does it is um, John Mortimer, who wrote the Rumpole of the Bailey series. And they have a lot of that. You know the pattern. Every, every, every Rumpole story is a story about a case. And it always goes exactly the same way. And the fun is the journey. And the fun is watching to see how Rumpole will pull this off. But you know exactly what's going to happen from beginning to end. And, uh, and that, I think, is a really, really hard kind of comedy to, go, to do because it it works against that whole comedy of surprise. Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, what about, um, there's a, it's, it's a fairly new term in comedy, but um, it certainly has been an older one and that is snark, um, where you have the banter and the, 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 uh, you know, the word play and, and things like that. Um, where do you find the humor in that? Do people find the humor? Anybody? I mean, you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, that's, you know, about all it is, is smart ass dialogue. Uh, one of the oh, things I'll that- kill you. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and actually, you know, sometimes you wonder about, people not figuring this out it's like spider-man in the comics <laughs> is all about smart ass dialogue right and right. in the movies he's not a smart ass it's like come on guys <laughs> this isn't that hard in fact some ways i think smart ass maybe as easy a comedy to write as anything yeah. um it, it's you know mm -hmm. they, they play off each other and i uh, oftentimes i'll have smart ass dialogue in my serious fiction um, it's it's a way for the characters to relieve tension and and also the, you know relieve tension for their readers and stuff too. But right, but yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. So um, what would you say are uh, elements of um, of good comedy? It's funny. <laughs> it's funny. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Does that mean? But you know. I often hear that what is funny to some people are is not necessarily funny to others. Um, how how do you get your reader along for the ride and find it humorous? I think humorous. I, one of the things that you have to do is um, well, either either you have to know your audience really really well, and you have to know who your audience is, which is really hard for for writers because it's whoever buys your book or, or reads your story and you don't have any control over that. But I think the, um, I, I'd like to hear what other people have to say about this, but I think often one of the techniques is that you're, you're scattering in things, kinds of humor for a lot of different audiences, things that different kinds of people would like. I know um, you were talking about, you didn't like the Sitcom, I, I agree with that mostly, right. but um, but I think Positive like problems. something like Big Bang Theory did a really good job. And one of the mm -hmm. things when we first started watching that, uh, first of all, my husband's physics teacher friends all called us and said, you have to watch this show. It's it's made for 
for physics teachers. It's a physics teacher <laughs> show and the humor is hilarious for the physics teachers. And then at the same time, I was hearing from my science fiction friends who were saying, oh my God, you have to watch this. It's the science fiction, you know, uh, humor is just great. It's definitely a show designed for science fiction people. And then uh, a couple of my friends called and said, okay, I think this has all the elements of a romantic comedy, which you always say you like. And so I, I think you should watch this show. And it had, in fact, all of those things, plus slapstick, um, plus, plus wordplay, plus snark, plus just, you know, all kinds of things. And, and it was one of those where if you aren't laughing at this joke, you're laughing at the next one or the next one. And they're coming really fast. So I'd like to know what you guys think about I, that. You know, I agree with that. I was, I was going to think a lot of it is using different kinds of humor and different kinds of humor, both in technique and situation, so that what's funny for one person might not be funny for someone else and vice versa. And you're right. Uh, when I said te most television, Big Bang Theory did a fabulous job of not doing mostly comedy of embarrassment. There's right. always a little, right. but but right. mostly not. And there were other ones, even early on, um, Two and a Half Men was really good. It got later into other stuff that was more comedy of embarrassment, but, but um, you know, so there are good, good comedy shows out there, but I think you're right. I think it's about writing different kinds of humor so you can get different people in and mm -hmm. laughing. I, I think it's helpful to bring in different types of humor and you can connect with more readers. I don't think there's any way of getting around the fact that humor is subjective. And if something makes you fat laugh, it's funny to you. And if it doesn't, it's not so funny to you. Terry Pratchett, I think, hits on every level of humor I can think of. And yet I know people who just, they read it and they don't laugh. They don't think it's funny. And there's no arguing with them. You know, I think it's hilarious, but it's subjective. Right. Yeah. 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 Now, when you say uh, comedy of embarrassment, uh, Richard, what, uh, for our audience, what does that mean? Well, I mean, basically it means taking your characters and having them being a lot of times idiots and getting into embarrassing situations and, and people are just laughing at them because they're being, the, the character is being embarrassed by whatever's happening or getting embarrassed. And, and in that, not with. Yeah, yeah, it's at, that, there you, that, that's probably the biggest thing. You're laughing at the person more than with them yeah mm -hmm. okay. very good i one yes. of my favorite episodes of of uh, big bang theory was one where um they always tease uh you know howard about not having a doctorate and you know and uh, wanting to wanting to be as good as the other guys and so on and it's kind of a running joke and uh <clears throat> but there was one <clears throat> episode where penny had had something <clears throat> to drink <clears throat> i'm sorry <clears throat> could have had something to drink and she made a joke they were all making jokes about Howard and then she made a joke that went too far and it was really fascinating because they taped with a live audience and the deafening silence from that audience when she said it it was like that broke the rules you're supposed to be laughing with the person not at the person and it was and then the rest of the whole episode was based on her attempting to atone for that um, but it was treated as a real hurt and it was treated, uh, it's kind of the opposite of, of humor of embarrassment where you're with the characters, you love the characters and you don't want to see, you don't want to see them humiliated. You don't want to see anything like that. So I, I, I think Big Bang Theory is, is a love it or hate it kind of show. I know a lot of people who, I love it. I know other people who do and some people who strongly dislike it. And I think that's the reason why, whether you perceive that the characters are being made fun of and we're laughing at them or whether you right. perceive as I do that we're supposed to be along for the ride along with them for the ride and laughing with them right yeah and that's a I think that's really tough to get that to strike that balance you know yeah it seems like getting everybody is, is never going to happen you, you know right. you write the best humor you can and whoever yeah. likes it likes it yeah that's uh that's true um Let's say, for example, you uh, decide that you're going to be writing a humorous story. Um, 
how would you how would you start uh, thinking in terms of uh, writing that human story? And we're going to start with Aaron because he's been quiet. <laughs> I'm a quiet guy. <laughs> the number one thing for me, I think, is to start with the story and then and then bring the humor in. I, I, there are people who are funny enough that they can, anything they write is going to be funny and make, make you laugh. I don't, I know that I'm not that funny. And so I've got to start with the story that people get involved in and then bring the humor in. And I think an awful lot of the best comedy works that way. I, I know uh, I used to be amazed at someone like, like you, Connie, who could write really hilarious stories and also write really deep, sad, powerful stories. And I would think, that's like a pitcher who can also go step up and hit home runs. All right. And since then I've realized not so much you, to write a really good, funny story. You need to be a good writer and a good storyteller. And so it's, it's yeah. not necessarily all that different. Yeah. That's a How good point. You? you have to have the story. The, the elements of the story are basically the same as in a drama. I mean, you handle them differently, but you still have to have the, the arc, the character arcs and all that stuff. The same as you do in a drama. Yeah, Shakespeare was real fond of doing, um, taking the same <clears throat> same material, and doing you know a tragedy like Romeo and Juliet, and then taking the exact same plot, and doing much ado about nothing, and um, he you know he knew that the story was it was all in how the story was handled, how it was, uh, the attitude that you had toward it, and the the it wasn't the material, it was it was the treatment, and the attitude toward life were where in Much Ado About Nothing, things don't end badly, they end well, and the misunderstandings are not permanent or irre irre unfixable. Um, I can't think of the word I want. Um, irreversible. Thank, irreversible, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, sure. uh, and they are, you know, nothing, nothing is, uh, everyone is very forgiving, and, and they're really, that's really the only difference in that story. Uh, in the in the treatment and then of course he adds lots of other things just like we were talking about before he adds dogberry who's a hilarious um uh slapstick character and a a bungles the language badly you know and and he uh, he adds a number of of funny bits and slapsticky bits and lots of other things for everybody else and then and then keeps the main story so yeah so when you uh what Connie, when you uh, start a book and you've decided that it's going to have humor or is going to be humorous, um, what do you start first? Well, oh boy, that's a really tough question. When I start any of my stories, I always start with the premise of the story, the, the plot. The plot comes first, the characters are whoever I happen to need for the, to do the plot. Um, and some stories have potentially more humorous, like being my in Road to Roswell, my heroine is a, her, her roommate, her old roommate from college is getting married and she's marrying a UFO nut. And my heroine has come out a very reluctant bridesmaid <clears throat> to be in the wedding in Roswell. And then, and, and, asked, and it's during the UFO uh, conference. And so, so he, she has to put up with all these morons who believe in, who believe in uh, UFOs and aliens. And then she it runs to the car to get something for her roommate and, and ends up being abducted by an alien and dragged all over the Southwest. Um, and I, I think I, it would be, I would be hard pressed, I think, to come up with the really tragic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> really serious, grim, maybe not. There have been an awful lot of really grim uh, alien abduction stories, which is one yeah. of the reasons I wanted to write a funny one. But, um, but uh, I'm I'm always thinking in terms of the situation rather than rather than the humor and I, I and I don't somebody said was it Aaron who said oh no it was Richard who said you have to you have to add the humor later you think of the story first and then add the humor I'm wrong if, I'm sorry if I got that wrong but um, the uh, but it's not like you plug it in or add it on like like sticking you know gumdrops right, on top right. of your cookie it's uh, it's built in but it's not your top it's not your top priority. It's not, the top priority is the story. And I always feel like, not necessarily in my short stories, but in my novels, there's gotta be a point where you're really affected and you're really as upset and worried 
about the outcome as you would be in a really tragic or serious story. Uh, right. you've gotta, there's got to be something real at stake, and uh, it can't just be it can't just be la 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 all the way. That humor is a uh, comedy is not necessarily light. It there's always moments of darkness in it, or it doesn't. I don't think it works. So. Yeah, there was so a you thing. have to have a balance. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Go ahead. that's okay. There was a thing I, I think Terry Pratchett said. I'll, I'll probably get it wrong. Connie, you probably know it, where he was talking about this topic is too serious for a drama. You have to put it in a comedy. Right, exactly. Exactly. That's very true. Very true. Yeah. You can do all kinds of things. One of my favorite things in Terry Pratchett is, um, and now I'll forget what the book is, but um, it's it's the one where there's the postman and um, and the someone is burning all the letters and the flames are curling up from the letters and the and the letters are screaming deliver us deliver us and on one level that's really funny you know because they're male you know and they need to be delivered right mm -hmm. but at the same time it's just a heart-wrenching you know what what do they mean deliver us and because deliver us also means save us and so and it's one of those where i'm like that's what makes him really a great writer i think uh, he was he was just brilliant at that kind of thing. The two two edges, the the really funny and light and silly, and then the really serious underneath. I think about all my all time favorite humorous science fiction fantasy, both in terms of books and movies. They're all almost without exception. They're all things where I was absorbed in the story and cared about the outcome. Pretty much the only exception I can even think of is sometimes Monty Python. I'm just enjoying mm -hmm. the jokes. And I don't really care where the story goes, but <laughs> that's the exception that proves the rule. That's true. Yeah. 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 Although I mean, it's not that they don't I, have story in, in the movies anyway. They, they do actually have a story. Have a story. Yeah. yeah. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. at least some semblance of the story. With the police, but it is yeah. the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. My sister was so disappointed when that happened. She was like, oh, the police showed up. Oh no. Yes. So far. <laughs> that, that, I thought that was hilarious. Well, you know, Monty Python is one of those you were talking about the exception to the rule. I hate Monty Python because you sit down and you're like, okay. And I'm talking about the shows, not necessarily the movies, although the movies do this too, but you're like, okay, this, this skit is a, is basically the, the, Parrot skit is a th th thesaurus skit. You're simply using a whole bunch of, of synonyms for dead in this skit. And that's all it is. And it just gets funnier and funnier because you pile it up. Okay, get that. And then there's one that's pure slapstick. All the, all the um, cartoon things are pure slapstick. Okay. And then I get this is about this kind of tangential thinking. And then they'll have something like the exploding animals at the zoo. And I have no idea why it's funny. And I have no idea what category it fits into. All I know is that I'm really laughing uproariously, even though animals are exploding, which is not usually my favorite thing. And I just, they drive me crazy because they can do humor where you're like, there has to be a reason why this is funny. I know there's a reason, but you have no idea what it is. They're just so good. Well, the, uh, the exploding animals, I would say it's probably the absurdity of it. It's just well, so absurd. Well, they're you definitely really... absurdist. Yes, yes, they yeah. are. The fish slapping, all those <laughs> things are. Oh God! Really... Yeah. The fact that the credits are in Norwegian or Swedish or something. Yes, yes. None of it that makes any wonderful. sense, but it's all wonderful. So, yeah. Yes, yes. This is true. Um, so while while we're well. I was going to ask you the same question, um, Richard. Um, oh, good point, Wes. Uh, he said uh, Mel Brooks did some uh, humorous science fiction too. Some great I eight balls. <laughs> yeah. Baseball, Baseball, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. It was very, very funny. Um, one of the now things- that's satire, right? right. So satire is a particular brand of humor. And, and has to function a certain way because you you're taking something that exists and twisting it into something funny, um, you know, so. Yeah, uh, Young Frankenstein. Right, right. Another one. And- It was uh, excellent. Uh, oh, amazingly so. Yeah. Um, 
I was going to ask you, uh, Richard, uh, what do you uh, start out with uh, when you're thinking about, I know that you start out with the plot, but certainly you have an idea, especially with narcolepsy. Right. Well, with narcolepsy, I started out with just his superpower. How can this be a superpower? And the first book starts out with, um, he doesn't know anything about this yet. And so it's a, it's kind of, it's an origin story, which can be problematic in some ways. Um, but it's, he's in bed with his girlfriend and falls asleep and she falls asleep and they, and has this dream. And then she gets really mad at him because he fell asleep while they were making love. And it goes from there. Um, but it's, uh, the first one's a lot about him discovering his power and how it works. Of course, there were some funny things like, well, I was figuring out his power, right? So there's one point in there where he gets hurt and gets sent to the emergency room. Well, we we're you know discussing it actually with the writers group um, about how does his power work? Well, you know, if he's touching you, when you when he falls asleep you end up in his dream but then if you touch him while he's asleep you end up in his dream and if you touch someone who's touching him you end up in his dream so he gets taken to the emergency room uh, and the ambulance technicians and the nurses and the doctors and the patient in the next cubicle everybody's freaking falling asleep and you know so it's it, you know that sort of thing happens um and interestingly, I've, I've actually, you know, the second one, I actually, you know, did kind of the Terry Pratchett thing. I had a, the main villain is actually attacking gays and transsexuals and all those sorts of things as, you know, evil sinners. You know, that's not a funny topic. Well, you know, yeah, I can make that funny. So I did. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's uh, one of the things I also added in there. And that was a surprise to me. I'm a pantser. I, I, I write things. I'm the opposite of Connie. Um, <laughs> I write things as I go and discover some the story. I mean, I know where I'm going, but then I discover things along the way that I hadn't expected. And one of the things in the first one was, oh, a lot of these dreams have a Wizard of Oz theme to them. And in the second one, I thought, okay, well, if we had a movie theme in that one, maybe we could have a movie theme in this one. So I started mm -hmm. out with Le Cage of Fall, and ended up with Victor Victoria instead. Oh. And so, so I had, you know, a man pretending to be a woman, pretending to be a police officer, and, and right. Julie Andrews was showing up being all kinds of people. And, and so, yeah, I had an idea what I wanted to do. And then, uh, you know, the dreams, you know, are, are in some ways the hardest part, because it's like, okay, what weird dream can I do now? Um, but and I got to keep coming up with new, new different ones. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's a superhero story. So in some ways the plot is there's a bad guy that shows up and we have to stop the bad guy. So it's not like it's a super complicated story. I mean, there's character growth in there and all that stuff too, but, but yeah, a lot of it's what's the power of the bad guy and what's the bad guy doing and how can this be funny? So mm -hmm. Okay, good, good answer, good answer. Um, let's um, let's see uh, if what's the time right We're good. now? We're fine. We're good. We're fine. What, yeah, I got like twenty minutes. Yeah, twenty minutes. So, um, do you have any thoughts about uh, writing comedy, and what kind of recommendations would you have to? uh writers who are interested in writing comedy connie first okay well one of my i would pitch for um running gags um they they carry the biggest bang for the buck they are cheap and cheap and easy and they don't even have to be funny they just have to be repeated um and some of my favorite um things in comedy are a result of the running gag um, this is where you have the same thing again and again, sometimes with variations, sometimes not. In the movie Thoroughly Modern Millie, um, the elevator is, was, had showgirls practicing their routines in it too much and they broke it. 
And so now everybody who goes up and down in the elevator has to dance to get it to move from floor to floor. Okay, so the first couple of times they get in and they have to dance and that's funny. And then, and then the very austere bad guy, bad villainous, gets in and you and you look at her for a minute and you're like now wait how is that going to work you know she's obviously not going to do a lively dance and then she does a very quiet sedate soft shoe and gets herself to the top and then at another point uh julie andrews is um uh trying to vamp her boss and she's all decked out in a 1920s vamp outfit and she gets in and you think now what's she going to do because if she does a dance that's going to ruin her you know, uh, vamp kind of approach. And she gets in, she gives one gigantic hip thrust and the elevator just shoots to the bottom. And so in each case, there's, there's a variation, but the result is every time somebody gets into the elevator, you're like, okay, what are they gonna do now? And you're already predisposed to laugh. And when you laugh, you're laughing at an accumulation of all the previous times in the elevator before so that you don't have to start from scratch and come up with your humor if from zero. You know, you're not going from zero to 60 each time. You're already at 45 and you get to, you get to 60. So I, I think that the, the running gag is really wonderful. And uh, Jack Benny basically did his entire career based on about five running gags. One was that he was really stingy and could not bear to part with his money. Two was that he was never gonna marry Mary Livingston, no matter how hard she tried. Uh, three, that he had an old pathetic car, a Maxwell that didn't work at all, uh, but he was too stingy to get rid of it. Four, that he didn't, couldn't play the violin, but thought he could and used to inflict it on everybody. And then five, I'm trying to think five. Uh, what? Oh, 39. Thank you. My husband's shouting 39 at me. Yeah, he was, he would tell everyone that he was 39 years old when clearly he was not. Um, and so he somehow made an entire career out of those five running gags. And one of his funniest moments was when he is robbed on the street and this guy says, stick him up. And then he says, your money or your life. And Jack Benny's kind of, hmm. And he said, didn't you hear me? I said, your money or your life? And he says, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And <laughs> the, it was the longest sustained applause and laughter of any joke in the history of television. And that was because they weren't laughing at the joke. They were laughing at the joke it up. plus all the previous times that he had done variations of that joke before. And, and yeah. So he, he did the same joke over and over, but he kept it fresh. It was yes. new every time. It wasn't right. the same joke every time. It was based on. Right. And, and so he kept it fresh, exactly. which is also important. You can't do the same joke over and over again. No, no. And, and yeah, and running gags, if you have variation, and then that's part of the fun. But once again, you're drawing the person into the story themselves. So you're a participant. You're not just an observer sitting back and laughing. You're, you're a participant, I think. So Connie, you try to think about how to build up running gags when you're writing a serious, a, a humorous piece. In general, do you feel like you approach writing humor differently from writing a, a more somber tone no. work? No, I use running gags in all my work. They, okay. I mean, they don't look like running gags, but they're repetitions, uh, repetitions of lines, repetitions of themes, uh, repetitions of incidents, sometimes with can build to a really powerful, just like the running gag, you get the benefit of all the times you did it before. So that like, if the character has, if you've run into this line, I'm, I can't think of a good example right now, but if you've run into this line three or four times in the story, and then at the very end, the person says it um, and, or says it in a new way, I'm thinking, forget the Alamo from, uh, Lonesome, from Lone Star. Um, it just breaks your heart. You know, it's the same impact, except instead of laughing, you're, you're crying or you're profoundly touched or something. So yeah, running gags are everywhere, everywhere in, um, in the movie Spotlight about um, the, the Catholic Church scandal, the pedophilia scandal. Uh, and it's, the story is about the, the Boston reporters that broke that story and uncovered the horrible extent of, of the scandal. Um, and uh, in there, one of the things they do, which I consider a running gag, is um, 
they they start out and you're not really totally aware of this but it's boston so there are churches everywhere so if so there's they're meeting and you can see a church through the window and then uh, this guy has gone to interview somebody at a coffee shop and you can see a church across the street and then somebody goes to the hall of records to look something up and he crosses the street in front of a church and and in each shot if you watch the movie carefully the churches get larger and more looming <laughs> and it it's sort of a stand-in symbol for the power of the church the omnipresence of the church and what they're up against what these five little reporters are up against trying to break you know break into this and i just watched all the president's men and uh, listened to the commentary for the first time with robert redford's commentary and he said they did the same thing with the government buildings in uh, all the president's men, or rather Spotlight did the same thing as they did because all the president's men is older. But um, they where where the, you see the guys and then you see the looming, you know, uh, Capitol or the looming White House. And uh, they're always shot from below so that they really look big and looming. And that it, it helps paint that picture, but it is a running gag. I mean, it's a, it, we don't think of it that way, but yeah. Yeah, I would that's say a, every, te interesting. every technique that you use for comedy applies to everything that you write. So. Well, so that's what I was getting at. What makes it, when you're using the same techniques, how do you make one story end up humorous and one story not? And, and the reason I'm asking is I know some people, like I'm thinking of one fellow in particular who is one of the funniest people I know. His he fiction is almost always very somber. And I'm always saying, you're so funny, put some of your humor in. So how would you tell someone like, how would you help someone like that to, to remember to add more wit and humor as they're going along using the same techniques that they might use in a more serious story? I have no idea. Richard, do you have any idea? Yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a hard one. I mean, yeah. I guess the question would be, you know, start with why is the work always somber versus, versus funny? Um, you know, why are you writing this instead of that? And see if you can dig deeper into their, why they're writing and stuff. Um, but I mean, yeah, I never necessarily thought I was going to write humorous story until I picked up narcolepsy. You know, I've got snarky dialogue in pretty much all of my stories, but, but humor itself um, was not something I thought I, I could, I, I could do. And then I, and did it so yeah. um yeah well and you don't want like that the problem with humor is that like if you're telling i'm trying to think if there's anything funny in spotlight um i don't think there is i think the feeling was that anything any funny lines any funny dialogue there's some kind of ironic dialogue and some sarcastic dialogue in the movie but otherwise i think they felt that this was a really serious issue and any humor would undercut what the power of what they were trying to do. You know, not that anybody would make jokes about pedophilia, but just, you know, that, that joking about anything would cut into the building, this horrible dramatic, it's one of those dread, it's like a horror movie. As you think, you know, there's this minor thing going on and then it gets worse and worse and worse and you keep uncovering more and more that's hideous going on. Um, so I think people make decisions about what should be in and out. And I have sometimes taken out dialogue, which I just thought was great dialogue and very funny, but felt that it worked against the overall theme of the story. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't know, maybe he's right. Maybe he should leave it out or figure a way to twist it around so that he's using the same techniques, but to a different end. So, yeah. Um, one thing I have noticed um, and it was the first short story I got published. Um, I had written it according to what I suspected my reader was looking for when I wrote the particular story because it was in a particular anthology. And so I had a mental vision of the type of humor that the uh, that the editor was looking for because of the type of people who, um, because of the readership. 
And I'm wondering if you have ever done that or have thought about that when you write humor. Um, Richard? Not particularly, no. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, write things I'm interested in and hope someone else is interested in them too is about it and that, you know it's the same thing we kind of said about you know we hope hope it's funny when someone else reads it uh, right but how about you aaron i can only think of one time i've done that um one of my humorous stories that was published was deliberately intended to be a bizarro story which is a subgenre that i like to read and very mm -hmm. strange little subgenre with a lot of absurdist elements and over the top elements. And I like to read it. And one day I was thinking, wow, I could never write anything like that. And as soon as a thought like that hits my head, then mm -hmm. I got to try. Yeah. So I wrote, deliberately wrote a story that was designed to be bizarro. And so I did things that I thought bizarro readers, bizarro editors would like that most people would scratch their heads at. The one that I remember is the story begins with this outrageously long run on sentence and everyone in my writer's group said, what the hell is this? You can't you gotta edit the sentence, this is terrible. And I kept it in there and, and the bizarro place I sent it to bought it because I, I bet that they liked that, that opening. But usually, yeah, I'm, I'm like, Richard, I, I write what I, what I feel like writing, what's, what I hope will come across well, but I'm, I'm not writing it toward a particular group or person. Mm, okay, okay. And how about you, Connie? Yeah, I, I, I'm with the guys. I, I don't, uh, I'm just amusing myself. I'm just, you know, I'm laughing, so I'm happy. And uh, I assume that uh, if other people are, are, if I'm laughing, that other people will laugh, um, which is not always true. But, uh, but one thing I have learned from the very beginning of my career is with some, a couple of early stories that were not comedies, but that the more personal the story is to you, the the more universal it is. Mm -hmm. And the answer is not to try and figure out the, you know, trends or anything, uh, or what what might appeal, what kind of story might appeal to other people, but just to, if it's a story that you really care a lot about and you have a huge investment in, I'll bet mm -hmm. you anything that there is an audience for it. So, and that, that has been my experience throughout my writing career. So I don't know, mm -hmm. maybe if that, maybe that's not true for other people, but for me, it was true. Well, um, I agree with you uh, for the, you know, I agree with you for the most part. Um, it's just, it was kind of a funny uh, situation where, um, where it, I did write for a particular group and oddly enough, it won an award, but you know, it, it, it comes down to, I guess it was funny enough. And in fact, the award givers, were completely like, how bizarre is this person going to be? <laughs> and, you know, and the other person said, no, no, I know her. She's okay. <laughs> you know, she's, she's normal. <laughs> but, you know, again, um, we can be, uh, we can be uh, judged according to our writing, I guess. So there you go. Um, what, uh, what elements do you use, Richard, when you, uh, when you, uh, elements of comedy do you use when you write? Define elements of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Slapstick. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Sure, there's yeah. some slapstick in there, and there's wordplay, and 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 uh, running gags, and running gags, yeah. Like you know, in the in the second narcolepsy, one of the things that's happening, one of the running gag, my editor had me take out a running gag that wasn't working. The running gag that was working was the they figure out fairly early that the, in fact, I think in the first encounter that they need to go to this church to find out who the pastor is, who's the guy that's probably behind this whole thing. And every time they head out for the church, they get called to go to another supervillain attacking somebody. So they, they keep, you know, getting diverted from going to the church. So it, 
it uh you know that's a running gag again you know okay what's gonna happen this time when they go back to you know go to the church and some of them are are yeah there's there's silliness and and um i think even in the first one i think i put in oh yeah there was at least one fart joke um but that yeah. was you know it was it was about so you know again it was built into the story the the super villain um the main supervillain, you know, expands himself into a ball and he's bouncing around and he's crushing people when he's bouncing on them. And when he comes out of being a ball, well, that's when it doesn't smell very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, lots of different kinds of things. And that's one of the things I do try is to do lots of different things. So good. Good. And how about you, Aaron? Um, I do really appreciate absurdist humor. So when I'm writing a lighter piece, a, a piece I want to be funny, I try to add in more, ever more outrageous elements. But I, I also try to remind myself, because I think the humor that works the best has a, a serious element of truth to it, that, it, that it's something that resonates with people, even if it's an outrageous situation they can never imagine being in. And so I try to remember that as I'm writing, you know, if, if I, so this last piece with the father and, and son, I try to incorporate, you know, experiences I've had as a father and, and, and try to frame it in a way where other people who have kids or other people who are kids, which is going to be everybody, th they're going to say, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's how it would go. Even, even though it's a situation they would never be in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, we're going to uh, finish up right here and uh, last words so, uh, of this panel. Uh, we'll start with uh, Connie and go on to Richard and then Aaron and then me. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I would say that don't ever lose sight of the fact that you are telling a story, a real story that matters, not just, not just, uh, it can be light and frothy and um, can have a happy ending, but it, it still has to have, uh, there's got to be something real at the heart of it and something that you can relate to. And I know uh, my, one of my favorite comic novels is Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. And it's, mm -hmm. it's so silly. And it's all about these three guys who are trying to just go up the River Thames on a boating weekend. And it, it's about nothing. And it's, it's kind of a <laughs> Seinfeld episode in that way. Uh, and it just, uh, it's, it's fun and it's light, but the truth is you can totally, when he does the chapter on packing, you, you totally relate to that. You have tried to pack and couldn't remember if you got your toothbrush in and then had to take the whole thing apart to see if your toothbrush was in and it was in. But then when you, when you packed again, you couldn't remember if you'd left it in, et cetera. We've all been there, you know, and we've all been in a situation of having had a little bit too much to drink and then being attacked by swans or if not swans, <laughs> imagining that we were attacked by swans. And, you know, or uh, there, my favorite chapter is the one of, the, the songs, uh, the comic songs, where you're subjected to someone trying to sing a comic song in front of other people, and he can't remember the words, and he, and he gets the two different songs confused, the, the chorus from one and the verse from another, and, and it's humiliating and painful, and the, um, and the pianist retires because he has a wife and children to think of, and et cetera. And it's just, it's just wonderful, but it's all stuff that you have lived through. It's only a tiny exaggeration of what you yourself have experienced. And so uh, I think if you keep your, your humor firmly grounded in things that have happened to you and things that people can relate to. You're good, like your dog climbing on top of you there and <laughs> completely smothering you. <laughs> yeah. Um, just really quickly, I think what Connie was saying earlier about, you know, dig for the truth. If it's funny or if it's not funny, you're still digging for truth and bringing truth into your story. Um, and then just how you treat it to make it funny. So. We're almost out of time, Aaron. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly uh, add to that. The, the converse of that is I find a lot of my more serious science fiction stories are just things that I was noodling about. Oh, what if you're on a planet where you know, symbiotic or organisms do this? But humor uh, much more often is inspired by things that, that I experience in real life. And, and it's not even necessarily that I'm thinking, oh, that'll make it funnier, but it's just 
it's something that really happened and a lot of times it really was funny and so into the story it goes and hopefully that helps the story to be funny right good right. job good job um i want to let you all know that um we can be on the discord in the discord uh chat room for a little while so if you have any questions you want to ask some of us um a few of them yeah. Yeah, I, I can't join you for that. I'm sorry, but um, that's but uh, at least I can, and maybe uh, maybe Richard and Aaron can. So, so. thank yeah, you. you can. For so. us. Thank All right, you. thanks everybody. Thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye. Have a great con. Bye bye. You too. Bye. <laughs>